The entity that is SCP-4840-A is an old man who calls himself the caretaker of the floating city of Autodopodopolis. He holds secrets that will change the Foundation's understanding of the world forever. The old man was initially encountered by Captain Francis Pike, who first explored Autodopodopolis for the Foundation. It was here that SCP-4840-A provided some insight into the city and its mysteries. Over a decade later, the Foundation has sent Dr. Val Ostorovich to interview the old man. Unbeknownst to her, everything she and everyone else thinks they know is about to change. SCP-4840-A walks into the room where Dr. Ostorovich sits. Please take a seat, she says to the old man. He looks around at the barren stone walls and takes a few steps into the center of the room. Dr. Ostorovich motions to the chair across the table from her. The old man pulls the chair out and takes a seat. Dr. Ostorovich leans over and pushes a button on the voice recorder resting on the table. That's very impressive, the old man says, examining the device. So it records everything I say? That is correct, responds Dr. Ostorovich. The old man looks around the room and then directly into her eyes. A smile cracks his lips. I wondered when the Foundation would want to talk. Like, actually talk. You are a seeker of knowledge. You reminded me a little of my brother. He may have been the greatest scholar that ever lived, and now you seek the truth. For that, we will need to take a journey billions of years into the past. Billions? asked Dr. Ostorovich. Billions? The old man answers, folding his hands onto the table. I was there from the beginning. The old man begins to tell his tale. It is so vividly worded that Dr. Ostorovich feels like she is living in the story. Like she's been transported to a different time and place to experience the creation of the universe and the fall of man. In the beginning, there was light. The Iron God manifested itself. His sword cut flaming stars into the sky. The god of flesh sprinkled drops of blood onto the earth, creating the first life. The serpent of sin and its dark brother laid the foundation for what is and what is not. A young boy looked up at the sky as the earth began to turn. He watched the creation of everything from the great hall of Autodopodopolis. This was where humans were born. Wait, I don't understand, says Dr. Ostorovich. Are you telling me that Autodopodopolis is like the Garden of Eden? I am not telling you that it is like anything, the old man says with a wink, but I think you want to learn more about a different tale, something I will get to in time. In the early days of the universe, there were only a few humans in existence. For millions of years, they watched through the haze of creation to learn more about the reality they were born into. They built the very first city, and upon completion, it became the spot where that which is came to be. There were only ever two true gods, is and is not. They were the only truths in the entire universe. Is brought the serpent into the world. It searched for whence it came and to learn about all the truths that had been hidden from it. The is not was the darker shadow of is. It controlled everything that stretched out beyond the world and into the unknown. The two gods could not exist without one another. When you refer to the serpent, do you mean the entity that resides in the Wanderer's Library? Interjects Dr. Ostorovich. One and the same, replies the old man. It was during the time after the is and is not finished creation that the monsters and demons inhabited the Earth. However, there was order. The monsters of other worlds were kept separate. These entities would be in the dreams of men, but were never able to cross over to their world. It was the strange folk to the west of Anadopodopolis that first opened their eyes to the cosmos. They were created from the last remnants of the Is, but were not human. They were something that could not be explained by logic. The humans were looked after by the mothers of the newly created world. The wolf, the bear, the sow, and the lion were their protectors. As the days went on and more men and women walked the streets of Autodopodopolis, they met in the great hall of the city, where they would seek counsel and listen to the first king of men. His name was Asim, which came from the word that meant is. His skin looked as if it were made of gold, and he had power beyond imagining. Although Asim was only a man, he could create mountains with his hands and deep oceans with his feet. 
He had a lance that could kill even the gods. Assem was a great leader, but deep inside of him grew the first vice of men, envy. He would look to the heavens and desire them to be his. Humans had built the greatest city that would ever be, and yet, the king wanted more, so he took it. Assem was the first being to seize something from a world that was not his own. He stole a crown, and when he gathered the inhabitants of Adidopodopolis to the Great Hall to show them his new relic, he declared himself the king of all that is. He built a seat of power on top of the spot where mankind first found is. Assem was still kind to the people of Adidopodopolis, but he always desired more. Then the great betrayals came. Assem's sons grew up in the shadow of their father's envy. The first betrayal was by his middle son, who coveted his father's crown. He demanded that it be passed on to him, and when Assem refused, the son amassed an army and laid siege to the world. But the middle son was struck down by his father and locked in a stone tomb deep under the grounds of Adidopodopolis. The second betrayal came from Assem's oldest son, he went behind his father's back and spoke passionately to the people using sense and reason to demand that they make his father give him the crown. The people of Earth worshipped Assem's oldest son as if he were a god. Seeing this, Assem removed the poison that his eldest son had put into their minds. He then dealt with him by casting his son to the most desolate place on Earth, where he would wander until the sun went down in the east. The most devastating betrayal of all came from the youngest son of Essium. He came into his father's bedroom while he slept and took the crown from his head. The youngest son and his followers ran away with the crown. When Essem awoke, his heart broke with what his youngest son, whom he loved more than anyone or anything in the entire world, had done. An endless rage welled up in the king and he turned the earth into a smoking wasteland. Assem searched tirelessly for his youngest offspring and the crown. His envy knew no bounds, and he desired nothing more than for his crown to be returned to him. For thousands of years, Assem searched but could not find what he was looking for. The crown had been hidden away and slowly faded into legend. The world gradually returned to normal. Fields began to regrow and forests sprouted from the smoldering embers of the planet's wide siege that Assem had carried out in search of his crown. The followers of his youngest son spread across the region, which would later become known as Europe. Then came the time of endless wars. Men fought demons and monsters. Men fought one another. From these wars came the deaths of many and the ancient ruins that have long since been consumed by the sands of the earth. But these wars would lead to the current age of human history. During the Great Wars, one man hid and watched from the Great Hall at Adidopodopolis. He witnessed the world consume itself, but the worst was yet to come. Zorus, the Sky King, found his way to Adidopodopolis and demanded that he be given the Lance of Essem. However, the Lance had been lost long ago with the fall of the first king of man as he ravaged the planet looking for his crown. Zorus refused to believe that the lance was not in the city and began to destroy Adidopodopolis as he looked for it. But before Zorus could completely demolish everything, a hidden mystery was called upon to stop the threat. The last of the titans, the great dragon Bahrath, who slumbered beneath the city, emerged from the earth and carried Adidopodopolis into the sky forever separating it from the men of the world. You mean, until the Foundation discovered it, says Dr. Ostarovich. Well, yes and no, replies the old man. That was one before you. The history of man progressed. Deva, hero of Gilgamesh, killed Saras II's only son in single combat on the fields of Jerusalem. The dreaded sorcerer Noah el Menthoth flooded the lands until he was killed by Maladru, the wrathful. Jorai Apollyon sailed across the Great Sea to meet with the king of the Night Children, but was buried alive to feed the heart of their tree goddess. Then from the east came Lancelot. Like the knight from King Arthur's Knights of the Round Table? asked Dr. Ostarovich. The old man frowns. No, oh, that was a different Lancelot. The one who came to the floating city was called the Demon Lancelot. As the demon Lancelot approached Adidopodopolis, any remaining allies who still walked the earth were called upon for assistance. The evil army that the demon commanded would not be easily defeated. Lancelot first targeted Bathrada, the old dragon who had lifted Adidopodopolis into the skies. 
Next, he battled the Sea Lord, Arcturus. He made quick work of the hero Beowulf. And lastly fell the King of David. All that remained between the demon Lancelot and the city of Adidapodopolis was one human. He took up his sword and battled the demon, but Lancelot was too strong. The demon used the flails attached to his six arms to demolish anything in his path. He was about to land the deadly blow when with its last breath, the dragon Bathrata ripped the demon Lancelot's heart out of his chest and cast him into the Temple of Sunset, where his dead body lies to this day. All was now quiet in Autodopodopolis. The gods and heroes of old had been lost or were hidden away. The search for the crown continued on, and even Asim himself is somewhere scouring the earth for his precious relic. The floating city of Autodopodopolis was forgotten. So, basically most of the SCPs that the Foundation contains come straight from your history, Dr. Osterovich says. Yes, I believe you are correct, replies the old man. Just from this story alone, there must be entities you recognize. And the fact that many of the gods, early men, and demons are immortal means you will probably hear more about them in time. The demon Lancelot may seem dead, but his body still radiates heat. I feel it is only a matter of time until we must do battle once again. Okay, there is something I don't understand, Dr. Osterovich says. The old man nods at her. Where do you fit into this story? I understand you were there at creation, but you know so much and I can't help but feel you are leaving something out. The old man pauses. He lets out a long sigh. My name is Seth, the old man says. Brother to Cain and Abel, son of Adam el Essam, the first king of men. I was the king's youngest who stole the crown. I was the one who looked at the night sky and asked my father for a star all my own. He pulled one out of the heavens for me, and it became the Iron Crown. It drove my father to madness, my brothers to butchery, and led to the ruination of our kingdom. The crown is the seed at the root of all evil. Seth stares blankly across the room, and it was meant as a gift for me. Now watch SCP-073 and 076 Cain vs. Abel SCP Animation, or check out SCP-343-God SCP Animation.